We're continuing our sermon series through the book of Philippians. This is week three. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. And if you were here last week, our message was all about unity. And and I feel like unity has been a prominent theme here in our church over the last few months. And I, I think that unity is a good thing to talk about because the unity amongst ourselves, our church, our culture, our world is always something that needs to be addressed. We need to be unified to one another, to Christ, and and we can be unified because of Christ and what he's done and the work that he did, but it's what we do with our unity that makes a difference. Because I can stand up here and I can claim we have unity and and we're one and, and we have this harmony about ourselves, but unless the people around us see it, feel it, and experience it, then I don't know if we're truly unified. And so today what I want to do is I want to look at, man, what can we do with the unity that Christ provides and how can we use that to become more like Jesus? Because I think each and every week as we show up to church and we go to our small groups and, and we go to where we serve, we should be striving to become more and more like Christ. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to look at his life. Because he gives us example after example of what it means and what it looks like to be united to one another and what it looks like to be united to the Father. So by looking at his life, we're definitely going to learn a thing or two. And so I want to continue this conversation that we started last week, that message on unity, humility, because what happens is selfishness and pride can get in the way and those things can actually destroy our unity and our humility. But before that, let's pray. God, we just give you this time. I thank you for the people in this room, the people maybe watching online. God, we just, uh, we come to you, we submit to you, we follow after you. And God, I just pray that you would use me over these next few moments, these next few minutes. God, I just pray that your spirit would uh, empower me to communicate your words, not mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And again, If you were here last week, maybe you weren't, that's okay. We saw that that Jesus prays for unity. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides that unity, but our, our own selfishness and pride can get in the way and destroy our unity. And looking at the church in Philippi, the book of Philippians, we see Paul is is writing to some people who are dealing with some unity problems. And there's, there's a, a verse in chapter four where he writes to these two ladies who have been just model perfect examples of what it looks like to be united and what it looks like to help lead people to Christ. And they have this argument. They're, they're disunified. And Paul is like, you need to cut that out. You're, you're sisters in Christ. Like you've helped so many people and instead of modeling humility, they were modeling hostility and that's the opposite of what Paul wants. That's why he writes that in Philippians and that's the opposite of what Jesus wants for us. And as believers, if we're to be truly unified, we have to model true biblical humility, but there's a difference between worldly humility and biblical humility. The world tells us to think lowly of ourselves, to think, man, I can't do this, and and I'm not good enough. But there's this old quote that makes a very good distinction between worldly humility and biblical humility. And I was, I saw it online and um, I was like, man, that is such a good quote. And and some people think C.S. Lewis wrote it. Other people think that maybe Rick Warren said it. The internet is undecided. So therefore I am undecided. I don't know who said it, but it says this. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And I read that, I'm like, man, SpongeBob could have told me that, and that is still the gospel truth. Biblical humility is simply thinking of others over ourselves. And that is what the world does not want us to do. The world says, man, think of yourself as number one. Think that you are better than the person next to you. You are the top dog. You're the best thing since sliced bread. We think, man, you, you simply cannot be better than me. And the world has taught us to stand up for ourselves, to view ourselves more highly than we ought, to think about ourselves as often 
as possible. What do, what do I want in this instance? What do I want in this situation? I feel like very few times do we actually put ourselves, uh, put, put others before ourselves. And Jesus shows us and he tells us again, time and time again, man, we have to value other people more than we value ourselves. I don't know if you have ever been on an airplane before, but when I fly, I, I can think some not good things because here's what happens when I'm waiting in that long line and they're boarding. Uh, they say, okay, we're gonna take first class passengers and group two and all this stuff. And I look down at my pass and it's like, group 17, is there, any, is there any space for me on this plane? And so when the people board before me, I get frustrated. And I'm like, oh, you think you're better than me, don't you? You make, you make so much more money than me. You, you just think you're better. And it's, I just praise God that I will never fly first class because if I flew first class, I would be like, yeah, you're right, peasants, see you later. I'm getting on the plane first. And it's like, if you have ever walked on a plane not in first class, you, you, know, you walk down the aisle, those people don't even want to make eye contact with you. They're like three chapters into their book already, and they're like, yeah, 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 keep walking. I would probably have the same mentality. The other day, I was driving down knees. I, w- I was going home, and um, most of that street, there's two lanes, but there's a couple instances where there's just one lane. And then there's like a weird little turn lane right next to it. And it's like, is this a passing lane? I don't think so. I think it's more of like, a, I'm going to turn into my neighborhood lane. And so I'm driving, I'm going the speed limit. I'm doing everything correctly, 10 and two, both hands on the wheel, right? And I get to this single lane part with this weird little turn lane thing. And I look in my rear view mirror and there's this little truck who's like slowly gaining on me. And I'm like, well, surely this truck is not going to make a pass. Like, that, that can't happen. There's not enough space. He's turning into his neighborhood, right? Well, sure enough, he guns it, and he, he gets in front of me, and I just, I just get fuming mad. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you driving like that? You think you're better than me? Are you, are you in a hurry there, my guy? Like, why are you driving like that? And of course, of course, my wife is sitting right next to me the voice of reason and truth and preposterous ideas because she says, what if they had an emergency? And I was like, I don't care if they had an emergency. And if someone did that to Rachel, I can't even tell you the things that she would say or do. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But man, I feel like when that guy passed me, I was like, he thought he was better than me. (laughs) If I was that truck, when I passed people on the freeway, I'm like, yeah, I'm better than you in my 2012 Corolla, let's go. Thing barely drives. Why do, we, why do we have this mindset that, man, I'm better than the people around me, and yet we get frustrated when the people around us think that they're better than us? Maybe that's just me. But um, this next story I'm going to share with you, I, I really hate to admit, and um, well, by now I've told hundreds of people, but before these last couple services, I've only told a handful of people because it makes me look like such a horrible human being. And... Um, I just want to let everyone know that I have learned, (laughs) I've learned from this instance of what I'm about to share, and I've come a long way. But um, before I got hired here at Cross City, I had a job interview um, in Southern California for this great church. It was a big church. It was a great history of the church, great senior pastor. And I have come to realize that I am just not a good interviewer. In fact, I don't even know how I got hired here, to be honest. Like, I really shouldn't have been, most likely. So I go in for this job interview, and the senior pastor's daughter and I went to college together. And they had a job opening, and she was kind of like encouraging me to apply. She's like, you should apply for this youth pastor position. I know how great of a job you're doing, all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, thank you. That's great. That's, that's, that's nice. So I had some conversations with some of their executive pastors and like, okay, you need to come in for the interview. Uh, and it seemed like they really wanted to hire me. And I felt like I was ready for the job, just not ready for the interview. And I'm, I'm trying not to sound egotistical or arrogant. And when I'm done telling the story, that's exactly how I'm going to look. Again, I have learned. I have learned, okay? And so some, some part in the interview, they asked me this question. Tell me about someone who is better than you at something. So tell you tell you about someone who's better than me at something? So in my mind, in a job interview, I need to exude confidence. I need to stand up for myself. 
I need to not seem weak. I need to not sell myself short. If you want me to tell you all the people who are better than me at being a pastor, why am I in the interview? Like one, that list is too long. And two, I don't have time to go over that. But I did not understand the question. And so they say, tell me about someone who is better than you at something. It did not compute in my little brain. And what I said to them is, I I can't think of anyone who's better than me at anything. (laughs) How stupid! How dumb can I be? How arrogant and egotistical. I, I promise you I've learned. But if you have a tomato, you can throw it. You can throw it now. Man, what a dunce. I I was so embarrassed later when they called thinking that I was getting a a job offer. (laughs) And they're like, "Uh, we're going to move in a different direction. (laughs) And I'm on the phone and honestly, I was a little devastated. I was really sad. And, um, you know, I I went in with a lot of confidence. Um, And I'm like over the phone, I'm like, yeah, can you just help me? Like, what did I do wrong? What did I, what did I say? Was there something that I could have done better? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the guy was like, yeah, the last guy we fired, the position that you're applying for, is, he was a really um, prideful, uncoachable, arrogant guy, and we're looking for the opposite of that. And I was like, oof, that hurts. But I'm here, so. <laughs> um, but man, I was in that, I was in that moment, and, and that's what the world taught me, right? Think of yourself highly, Think of yourself as number one. You deserved that job. And I just want to let you know that I was not raised that way and I try not to act that way unless I'm boarding an airplane or someone cuts me off in traffic. But I understand that I made a huge mistake. I made a prideful mistake and that's not how I want to live my life and that's not how I want us to live our lives. Humility is not beating ourselves down, but it is thinking of ourselves less. And in that moment, I was thinking pretty highly of myself. That's what Paul tells the Philippians in chapter two, verses one through four. This is what he writes. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, instead of being selfish and vain, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others, not thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself less, thinking about other people more, thinking about their needs, their wants, their desires, and their interests. And don't hear me incorrectly. This doesn't mean that we become a human doormat. That's not what scripture says. That's not what we're called to, but it's how we view ourselves in light of the people around us. And the person who modeled that perfectly was Jesus Christ, our perfect Lord, our King and our Savior. And Paul is writing and he's saying, man, if God has done anything for you ever, if God has done anything for you, there's no excuse for you not to get along with the people in your community and your church and the followers of God. But we have to move away from our our worldly, arrogant, egotistical viewpoint and perspective. And we have to see the things, uh, how Jesus sees them. We have to act the way that Jesus acted. Paul continues in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus had every right to be prideful, to be like, I am God, submit to me. But instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because he was a humble servant, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. But at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
We have to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and took on death. And like I said, there, there's so many examples we could look to throughout scripture where Jesus models this perfectly, but we're gonna look at three specific instances where Jesus models humility, he values other people above himself, and I want us to see how we can apply what Jesus did in his time for us in our lives. So if you have a Bible, you can go to Luke chapter eight, verses 40 through 49. But to preface that a little bit, um, Jesus went to one side of the Sea of Galilee and he has this interaction with this um, demon-possessed man. Maybe you're familiar with the story. This guy's chained up, he's cut up, he's probably looking and talking like a Tasmanian devil kind of guy and he's demon-possessed. And Jesus, he removes the demons, he puts them in the herd of pigs, you with me? The pigs go and they fall into the lake and everyone's freaking out and he's like, Jesus, can I come with you? He's like, no, you gotta go back to the city, tell everyone what I did for you. Okay, so after that encounter is where we pick up in Luke 8, 40 through 49. It says, now when Jesus returned, heals the demoniac, he returns. A crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. Another translation says that she had spent her entire life's monetary value, her, her, everything that she had in her bank account, she had spent everything and no doctor could heal her. No one could do anything. So she comes up behind him and he touched the edge. She touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter's like, Master, what do you mean? Who touched you? The, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Everyone is touching you. What do you mean? Who touched you? But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. And she said why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And while Jesus was speaking, someone from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader came and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus was on a mission. Jairus runs up to him and is like, dude, my, my daughter is sick. Can you come and heal her, please? And he's like, all right, I got this. Of course, you need a healing? I'm on my way. And the crowd is crushing him and people are bumping into him. I bet he's a little claustrophobic at this point. And suddenly he feels something leave him. He's like, my power, my, my power. I just, I just lost some of it. And in the hustle and bustle of trying to save this 12-year-old daughter, he stops. And he's like, who touched me? Jesus knew what happened. He knew that power left him. He knew that someone was healed and he could have just been, you know, kept going. Like, wow, I just healed another one. Yay me, bada bing, bada boom, going on to heal another. But instead, he shows us that he was humble with his time. If you're taking notes, Jesus was humble with his time. And what I mean by that is that Jesus took time out of his busy schedule his frantic mission to go and save Jairus' daughter, he met the needs of the people around him. And I feel like for us, man, we, we are just so consumed with being busy and filling our calendars and, and filling our schedules. And how often do we find ourselves in the middle of something, maybe like at work, and someone comes and knocks on that door and says, hey, you got a minute? And you know darn well you don't have a minute. Like you have a deadline, you, you got to meet this, this timeline and you're like, yeah, yeah, I got a minute. This happens to me like all the time in my office. I, I share an office with uh, our student ministries pastor and our junior high pastor. And so we, we like to chat, but I'll be trying to work and someone will pop their head in and be like, hey, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And, and really like sometimes I, I just have to say no, but most of the time I, I make time. I'm like, okay. Yeah, you can come in, you, you can come in. Sometimes a small group leader or a student will, will call me or text me or even step into my office and they really just need someone to listen to them. Even though I'm in the middle of, you know, maybe writing this message, 
or doing something that I, I think is super important. And I just, I do my best to, to hear them out, to give guidance, to give clarity if, if I can. Jesus took time out of his busy schedule to meet the needs of the people around him. How can we show humility with our time? I have a one and a half year old son. He is amazing. He's also a little crazy. He's a little cuckoo. He's in that stage where um, everything is like WWE, like SmackDown. Like he's climbing on the coffee table and he's like, ah! And uh, we, we just have so much fun together. He likes to scream. He likes to shout. He likes to do all those things. One of his favorite things to do is uh, if we're playing and I'm usually laying on the floor with him and I'll grab his hands and he'll like stand on my stomach and then he does this little Irish dance. He's like, la, 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 and he just like goes crazy on my stomach. It is amazing. Uh, definitely not made me throw up before, but um, he loves to play. And, and sometimes I'm not in the mood. <laughs> and sometimes I'm busy, I'm working, I'm doing stuff. But he'll come up to me, he'll run over to me, and he'll say, da da. And he'll throw his arms up. You know how kids do? And I pick him up and I blow on his belly, and, and we go and play. And I've learned that those are the sweetest moments I can have with my son because those moments are the subtle reminders to be humble with my time. Because I remember what it was like to be a teenager when mom and dad were not cool. And I would be like, yo, I'm leaving the house. I'll be gone for a few hours. I'm going to go watch a movie or go to the football game or go hang out with my friends. And I know that one day my son will not be a son anymore. He'll be a man. He'll be a, a full grown man. And if I'm not humble with him in my time now, I might not get as many opportunities in the future. So whether you have children or not, how can we all be humble with our time? Like Jesus was humble with his time because this lady, she, she ran up, touched his cloak. Again, he could have shrugged it off. He could have been like, I, I know what happened, but he pauses to have this moment with her to meet her needs and he meets her needs by healing her. Your faith has healed you. So maybe the next time you're at work and you hear that knock on your door and someone says, hey, do you have a minute? I encourage you to be humble with your time. Have that conversation. The next time your little one or maybe your teenage son or daughter wants to spend some time with you, make time for them. The next time you see your phone ring and it's that person that you know is going to be a long phone call, I encourage you to answer your phone anyway. It's in the moments where we least expect something to happen that God could use you to impact someone so dramatically and drastically. If we are humble with our time, how can we use our time humbly? The next interaction, the next encounter we see with Jesus comes from John chapter eight, verses two through 11. And you might be familiar with this story as well. It's the woman who's caught in adultery. Jesus is in the temple courts and, and he's teaching. And these religious leaders catch this woman caught in the act of adultery and they, they throw her at Jesus' feet and they're like, the law says we should kill this lady. What do you think? And they're trying to trap Jesus. But what happens is, man, he, he bends down. He starts writing in the sand. No one really knows what he writes. But as he does that, one by one, those accusers, they, they fall back. And eventually Jesus is left one-on-one -on -one with this woman who was caught in adultery. And this is what he says in John 8, 10 through 11. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. Here, number two in our notes, we see that Jesus was humble with his grace. Jesus was humble with his grace. And, and as the, the Messiah, the chosen one, the sent one, who was supposed to fulfill the Old Testament law, Jesus had every right to kill this woman. He could have done that if he wanted to. He could have scolded her, belittled her, made fun of her, condemned her, embarrassed her. Even more, 
than being caught in the act of adultery, which is probably embarrassing. He had every right to end her life. But what does he do? He models humility with his grace by showing her grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, and restoration. He's like, look, your opponents, they're not here. They no longer condemn you and neither do I. Now, this doesn't mean that there are not consequences for our sins and for our actions, but Jesus shows us perfectly what does it look like to be generous with our grace? Are we generous with our grace? Do we show grace to our spouse when they bother us or annoy us or we have to tell them the same thing the third time? Do we show grace to our children when they're loud or obnoxious or when they mess up and bring back a a bad grade or a write-up from school? Do we show grace to the angry clerk at the checkout counter? Do we show grace to the food server who brings out our food incorrectly and we just want to send it back? Do we show grace to the person who speeds up and cuts us off? Do we show grace to the people who are either boarding the plane before or after us? Do we show grace to our friends when they maybe forget to call when they said they would? Do we generously show grace the way that Jesus shows grace with this woman? Or are we quick to snap back to our spouse and make matters worse? Are we quick to put our kids in a timeout? Are we quick to ask for the manager? Are we quick to send the food back? Are we quick to maybe mumble something under our breath or give someone a gesture when they cut us off? Are we quick to think less of the people around us? Maybe we're quick to abandon those friends that we've had for so many years. Are we quick to condemn the people around us and not show them the grace that Jesus humbly shows and gives us? Philippians said this, rather in humility, value others above yourselves and in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus by taking on the very nature of a servant. We're called to adopt this mindset of humility, but it's more than a mindset. It's actually a lifestyle. We have been called to model ourselves after the servant of Christ. And what happens is in this call that Jesus gives us to become more like him and to become a servant, he's really calling us to a life of greatness. It truly is. But the way we attain this greatness is is humbly submitting through servanthood. Thinking of others more and valuing others more than we value ourselves. Philippians 2, 7 through 9 said this, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Number three, if you're taking notes, Jesus shows us that he was humble with his life. He was humble with his life. He became obedient to death. Death on a cross. Jesus Christ gave up his life so that we didn't have to. So that we don't have to face his final wrath and death and punishment. So we don't have to spend eternity separated from God. Because when this whole thing started, it was perfect. And we see Adam and we see Eve and they're in the garden and and there's perfect harmony and I'm sure it was pleasant. But then this sneaky little snake, he sneaks into this tree and he tempts Eve and he tempts Adam and they directly disobey God. And what we know, anything that goes against God is called sin. Anything that goes against God, we refer to as sin. And unfortunately, there is a punishment that we earn because of our sin and it's death and it's condemnation and it's eternal separation from God. Because of our sin, we deserve to die because of our thoughts, our words, our actions. When they go against God, which for me is every single day of my life, you know, I'm saved and I'm working on my sanctification. But think of all the sin in our lives, all the bad stuff that doesn't measure up to God's perfect standard. If it's not perfection, it cannot be in the presence of God. 
He cannot be around sin. And because of that sin, we are separated. But God, who is rich in mercy, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf, even while we were still sinners. And this is how he became obedient to death, death on a cross. Because what God has to have is death. And you're like, that's, that's, not, that's not God. God is love and, and God is forgiveness and God is mercy. That is correct. But God has to have death. Read the Old Testament. That's the whole point of Jesus. God, then he gets this, he gets this great idea. And he's like, instead of making all these sacrifices time and time again, I'm just gonna send my son who is going to appear as a man in human form. And what he's gonna do, he's gonna take on the the form of a servant and he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. He's gonna take your sin and he's gonna take my sin and he's going to wear it and he's going to bear it and put it on himself so we don't have to. So our past, present, and future sins are no more. And if you believe that Jesus was that perfect sacrifice, the perfect man who died for your sins and and came back to life, and if you want to follow him and you want to confess that he is Lord and you uh, you want to repent of your sin and make him the number one priority in your life, the Bible says you will be saved. And you can move from darkness to light. You can move from domination to liberation. And you can move from death to life. Jesus gave up his life so we didn't have to. And for some of you right now in this room, maybe today is your day of salvation. You've just been living in sin for far too long. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. In a moment, you're gonna have that opportunity. And maybe for some of us, man, we've just been, we've been living, we've been disobeying God, we've been rebelling against him for so long and, and the weight of our sin is just so heavy and, and it's weighing us down and we've reached this breaking point and we're like, man, I can't do this on my own anymore. What you need is a savior who died for your sins. You need Jesus to come into your life to change you, to mold you, and to transform you from the inside out. And if you're a Christ follower, you can give a testimony as how he will do that if you allow him to. But for others of us, man, we might have made that decision to follow after Christ. But are we modeling true humility with our lives? What what does our life say to the people around us? When they look at you, do they see humility Are you humble with your time? Are you humble with your grace? Are you humble with your life? Or do we have a problem with valuing ourselves over others when the reality is we need to put other people above ourselves? Jesus is calling us to a life of humility, a life of servanthood in order to attain Christian greatness. We have to die to ourselves value others before us and just take on this role of a servant. What would your life look like if every single day you woke up and you're like, I'm going to serve everyone I come in contact with. If you woke up and you served your spouse every single day and you served your kids and you served your coworkers and you served your employees or you served your boss, what would life look like I think we'd be a church that, I know we're a good church, but man, I think we'd be a great church. People would see us and be like, what has gotten into them? What has changed them? Why are they being so nice? Why are they being so servant-minded? And and the truth is, man, it's because Jesus has transformed you in a way that you want to model your life after his. So church, I want us to take the necessary steps to work on our humility, not valuing ourselves above others, but value others more. I want us to be generous with our time, be generous with our grace and with our lives. And I think if we can commit to that, I think God is going to continue to move in ways that we never asked, thought, or imagined. So right now we're going to enter into this this decision time. And if you need prayer, if you need to be baptized, if you need to make any type of decision on this spiritual journey. You're going to have time to do that. There's going to be a team of people down in front church. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's go show the world how humble we can truly be.